Ще, я думаю, що ми можемо розпочинати. Сьогодні вітаю всіх. Сьогодні нас багато присутніх спікерів і гостей. Я сподіваюся, на нас чекає сьогодні. І я сподіваюся, що сьогодні a heated and fruitful discussion. So today, uh, thank you for joining us. And we are all here uh, because uh, of the following theme. Uh, on the 22nd of December, um, the Verkhovna Rada has adopted a law about uh, spatial planning. And yet we would like to discuss it in a broader context of accession of Ukraine to the US, uh, EU and uh, to discuss our expectations uh, regarding post-war reconstruction of Ukraine. This event is organized on the platform of the Oroskvit Urban Coalition, but we are joined today from with our colleagues from the uh, Union of Architects of Ukraine, from the Chamber of Architects, from the uh, School of Urbanism Urbanina, from the Architectural Association of Lithuania, from the Association of uh, Ukrainian Cities, from the uh, Harker School of Architecture, and from the project of EU Housing Policy. And a bit later, we will be joined by the uh, CITES Think Tank. This event is supported by the International uh, Renaissance Foundation, but the uh, thoughts voiced today uh, reflect the position of the speakers and might not be shared by the Renaissance Foundation itself. So I would like to give the floor to Lilette Bradles, and soon uh, we will start the panels themselves. Thank you, Marco. And uh, yes, welcome to all. Very glad that uh, we are here in such uh, big numbers. And also thank you very much to the panelists who on such an extremely short notice uh, could free their evening and uh, and be with us and and share the knowledge uh, i'll keep it extremely short because we want to uh, keep all the time for the discussion uh just an extremely short intro of why we are here uh, that is indeed to discuss um the ukraine and, and the future of ukraine uh, but at all in, in the context of uh, a law that has just been uh, uh, submitted uh, through the parliament and accepted uh, by the parliament, the law called 5655, a law uh, which is about reconstruction. It is about um, the new urban planning regulations that will be implemented now and that will be lasting and determining uh, a large part of the future of Ukraine and how the future of Ukraine will look in terms of its urban planning and building regulations. So it's extremely important that what is being put in place right now is being thought through uh, very well and very good because it's you could say it's the fundament it's the fundamental start of how to to make a good reconstruction uh, this law has been criticized a lot uh, over the past uh, years already but especially uh, since it has passed uh, through parliament in the last weeks there have been thousands of signatures uh, against against it and that is because we uh, as, as uh, professional communities uh, from all different disciplines they see flaws in that law and since it's so fundamental we think it's crucial that those flaws are being removed and taken out so the discussion of today is to voice opinions is to voice uh, uh, the, the get to, to the to the heart of that law, but also not only to criticize, but also to come up with better ideas and to come up with reparations, let's say, of that law. So how can we better it and, and create a better law? So that is uh, one of the main goals is actually to come up with good ideas that we can submit 
uh, towards uh, the government uh, in an open letter, which will be uh, sent uh, either at the very end of this year or the beginning of January. So we hope that uh, you will all help us uh, all together. We can create uh, recommendations to, to better it. Um, so that's the very short introduction and uh, I give the floor to the moderator of the first panel, Filco Travers. So today we will start from the first panel, which will lead to the risks that this law carries. And the first panel uh, is about don'ts in this post-war reconstruction, what Ukraine can gain from the unfortunate experience from the previous post-war reconstructions, and what is the general role of the transparent and just procedures in spatial planning and making uh, any amendments to the law. And the moderator of this panel uh, will be the uh, Urban is from the Netherlands, who is working in Ukraine from 2015. He is a co-founder of Rosquit, Fulko Treffers. The speakers of this panel will be the expert on post-war reconstruction, Lilat Bredels, and a Ukrainian urbanist, one of the co-authors of the Manual on Reconstruction of Cities, Maxim Holovko. So I will give the floor to my colleagues and I would like to remind you that we are speaking in two languages today, so you are able to choose the language you'd like to listen the event in. Thank you so much, Margot, for this introduction. Um, and um, I will keep it very short in the beginning because I will ask some questions later on. But first, I'd like to give the floor to the to speakers. Um, I think, uh, Lilette, I start with you. You gave already an introduction on the course of this whole meeting, but let's zoom in to the risks and the don'ts of uh, the, the topic. Um, your experience with uh, international um, post-war reconstructions uh, is, is quite big, uh, being um, an editor and the chief of Archis, uh, so uh, please uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about this from your point of view. Yes, uh, thanks, Marco. Maybe you have some accompanying slides. Yes, um, so there's a lot of different uh, angles uh, I, I could tell about, and a lot of different cases of where actually you could say that that leg legislation and regulation created uh, more don'ts than do's uh, in, in post-war reconstruction. But I thought to keep it very short and to keep more time for discussion, I thought uh, to keep it only from Beirut. I think it's a very extreme case of, uh, let's say, what not to do and very much aligned to this discussion of today because it's all about the regulation that was put in, put in place in the beginning uh, directly after uh, a very tough uh, civil war that ended in uh, the 90s so from 1975 until the 1990 uh, the civil war was on so the reconstruction took place uh, 30 years ago please the next slide So this is a very rough picture of uh, of Beirut. Uh, you see uh, the green line which divides the east and the west. It's all very simplified in this uh, five minutes that I will talk about it. But uh, that is the division line between two parts of the city that were fighting against each other and where uh, a huge part of destruction took place. Where you see the orange line, it's uh, the city center, and you see how small part of the city that in the end is, that all the reconstruction efforts uh, went to. Uh, but you can imagine along a green line, there's a lot of destruction going on there as well. 
but most of the efforts indeed were put in the city center because it was such uh, let's say symbolic place uh, to start a reconstruction uh, next slide please so this was done uh, and here comes the law it was done by uh, a company a company called solidaire and that was the idea of the government was to create a company for reconstruction that would in tandem with the government uh, do all the reconstruction in in one go and that had to do with the idea it needs to go fast we we cannot wait forever because people need their houses back and they want the city hard back and we want to forget about this world so we have to act quickly and that resulted in uh, a format that they created in which they um, uh, bought the stocks of the people who owned the houses in the city center. It was a, a wild mesh of property rights and small entrepreneurs and, and uh, ownership. And because that made it so complicated, they thought that, okay, let's, let's do this in new format uh, and create uh, stocks, send them out and they can buy them back later. But this buying back later never could happen because all the regulations they put in place for the reconstruction were so strict and so, uh, let's say on a high level, that it could never be done by individuals. It could only be done by this one big company uh, to uh, create it on, on the standards and with the regulations that they put in place. So actually they prevented all the small owners to keep their property and do it themselves. They could never afford that. So they had to sell their stock. And in the end, this resulted, and maybe you can see that already in this slide, but also in the next one, in a kind of reconstruction uh, that uh, was high-end, super rich. Uh, the whole city heart was, is still uh, owned by uh, rich people from the Gulf who are never there. It's completely empty. And the people are not using it anymore because uh, they cannot simply afford also the kind of uh, establishments that are there so the retail is is all the high brands uh, dior gucci and so on and the the restaurants and everything are really only for for the the, the happy few let's say uh, the money is not around anymore so this whole heart of the city of Beirut completely emptied out. This is an image that is not an exaggeration, but it looks like that at the moment, um, 30 years later. So maybe the next uh, slide. So this is maybe you could say this is an exaggeration, but I don't think it is. This is how the city looks like at the moment. So you have this city heart, which is completely empty and which had, and that's another kind of regulation. Um, they wanted to keep the city heart like a kind of French modernism as it had before, as you could see in the style that it should be uh, low. So they had, uh, as a regulation, you, you cannot build higher than six floors. But uh, that, of course, for a developer is not very profitable. So they said, OK, in this part of the town, you can only build like that. But then in the rest, you can go as high as you want. And that is exactly what happened. So the rest of the of the city was like uh, mushrooms, uh, uh, high rise towards the city, uh, city site uh, to sorry, the seaside, which kind of privatized this whole sea from uh, the heart of the city and create a kind of wall of, of private uh, property uh, apartments. Next one. This was all done uh, in the end by this company, which had a huge stock also in the government. Uh, and that was called Solidaire. And this is uh, 30 years later, still the kind of symbol of a failed reconstruction and failed regulation. Uh, this is the owner of this hotel uh, who did have the money to refuse 
and he um, refuses to sell and and wants to keep his his place uh, but by all the regulation is not allowed to do anything with it so what he is doing with it he he keeps it empty it stays there as a kind of scar uh, of the whole situation with this huge kind of protest image of uh, stop solidaire who's the company behind it so uh, here with I, I conclude um, as an example of how something that wasn't meant to be uh, as, as criminal as it might look now, 30 years later, really uh, resulted in a disaster. I can, as said, name very uh, many more examples of deregulation in, in Pristina, in Kosovo, in many other places, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll keep it uh, with this for now. Thank you. Lilette, um, one question from my side before I give the floor to Maxim Holovko. Um, does this somehow uh, relate can you explain to to the audience how this relates to this law 5655 so where where does it state in 5655 that things like this could happen as well to make it a little bit more clear it is it has very much to do with uh rights given to uh to certain entities and in this case it's it's uh, a, a lot of uh, power given to a developer uh which is only uh controlled by the central government which in this case had a stake in the same company uh I so want to say this, this, this example was to explain about the, 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 the changing power more towards the private uh, uh, developers. So that was important. Yes. Okay. That, I, I don't want to say exactly that is the same as no, in no, no. Law, but in the, what is in the law is that it gives more power towards the private sector. That's for one thing. And the controlling mechanisms uh, of, of how to uh how they deal with that uh are being diminished let's say they are uh getting weaker in in the new law so uh that that are the main points i think thank you thank you let's uh, go on to maxim holovko um, uh, welcome and uh, maybe also for you the floor with a few statements in a few minutes So, welcome. I am Maxim Holovko from Urbanina, and I will make a short introduction so that you could understand why I am concerned. I am looking at this rebuilding project that will start after the war as the biggest building ground in Europe that we will have. And uh, it can have very positive influence on millions of people's lives. It can also be disastrous. So my concern is not to rebuild our cities the way they used to be, because in specific cities, ideas emerge about rebuilding the houses exactly as they used to be, because now we are living in cities built in the last century and we can feel that these cities of the past cannot meet the challenges of today uh, the centralized electric uh, network the centralized heating um, this all creates blackouts uh, resulting in deaths of uh, as a result of traffic accidents and so it is very difficult to use our cities efficiently because uh, we feel it now and when we talk about well we know how to rebuild our cities i am really scared and concerned because we are going to uh, make the same mistakes all over again what we would like to have is to introduce and reach all the goals that we have set in and uh, in the energy sector uh, in green energy but we have constraints 
uh, within the Ukrainian context itself, because here we are sitting and waiting for victory and the funds that we will get after victory to rebuild everything. And we are already assessing how beautiful the project of innovative hub uh, by Norman Foster will be in Kharkiv. But you must understand the resources will be minimal and this will affect drastically both the amount and the quality of the development. So if you take this shelter network uh, that was affected in uh, Switzerland, will not be possible in Ukraine. Uh, for instance, because we need also to maintain what we have and what we will have. And these concern, uh, concerns also other sectors, uh, sustainable building materials, green energy use, etc. But we must take into account the cost of the rebuilding work. And another concern is the scale, because we keep focusing on cities. We look at the examples of how cities are rebuilt. We are focusing uh, on cities with, uh, with millions uh, of population, uh, uh, but our ruination, our destruction is much vaster than just the cities. Uh, this destruction concerns all the areas of Ukraine and villages, townships, towns of Kiev region, Kharkiv region are also destroyed. We must remember about that. And so there are numerous towns and townships which are ruined by 80% and people continue living there. So we must take into account the scale of the ruination and the scale of rebuilding. And another grave concern a concern of mine, um, which I need to take into account to uh, face the risks honestly. Is the monopolization monopolization because mayors uh, keep changes changing, but the development of the city remains the same. And so this Uh, the power is concentrated in municipalities and it is practically monopolized. So if we take uh, the approaches to the development of the cities, uh, they are outdated. And yet another thing, uh, there is a lack of understanding of uh, the participation of civic society in reconstruction of Ukraine. So. Uh, it is unclear how to ensure that this participation can be uh, effective, the symbiosis between the civil society and the uh, construction companies. It is unclear in the situation of a war, but we need it, yet we don't have a solution yet. And another global challenge is we are still isolated. Ukrainian uh, architectural community is still isolated from the global architectural community. And so we will definitely need a lot of experienced experts so that we could rebuild the cities uh, on such scale. And this is part of our responsibility that we are not yet integrated. So we must, we must do everything possible to join this global community. If this, if we take this global Congress of Architects uh, to be conducted in summer 2023, 
Unfortunately, this Congress uh, doesn't have a single panel uh, devoted to Ukrainian uh, uh, reconstruction, though it has so many uh, other panels. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Maxim, for your uh, widespread words about concerns. Uh, I've got one question because what I thought was very interesting, what you said, uh, is the monopolization that, that is uh, happening from your point of view. Um, and you said, okay, the most continuous factor in this will be the developer. Um, how to, uh, can we think of partners in the city, stakeholders, a uh, better word, in the city that are even more continuous in the in the city that could be part of this process and could have an important role is that the civil society or should it be something else what would you think? I think we will definitely be able to find partners in the cities, but there will be a question of what cities will those be, because some cities are ready to communicate, are ready to change their views or strategic directions of their work. However, it will be difficult for us to work with cities that do not want to communicate. And here there will be another question, how should we try to change the desire to regarding their approaches. Uh, probably our main partner should be people who live in those cities because they will be the main beneficiaries of this reconstruction and development of those cities. And here there, we have a question, how should we do it? Because reconstruction has already started, as we can see, there is the strategy of uh, the development of Kharkiv, which shows that despite the war, a large number of people left the city. There is no way to organize a normal process of discussion. There is still reconstruction, but I don't have the response here. It's just a general question to everyone how we can stop this or how we can direct this into the right channel, or maybe it's just um, maybe, maybe there is just some. Maybe some people in the chat can answer to this as well, mm -hmm. but I will also now uh, uh, reach out to Lilette. Uh, so, because we are a panel, um, Lilette, um, how to challenge this and how to make this partnership in a city in a better way? I think what is very important is to find ways to engage the general public because uh, it, it is enormously uh, amount to have 40,000 uh, signatures uh, to, to this law, but on, on, the, on the, the vast uh, uh, amount of people, uh, it's nothing, of course. So how do you make those things that are happening uh, clear to many more people? And therefore, uh, use of local media is super important and to really to get quality programs and discussions panels on uh, the local issues uh, abroad. I, I think but, but, uh, a I lot agree. Of, uh, Christina? Sorry to, under, uh, to interrupt, but um, also looking at the time. But this is, of course, like a, a process that you can organize or try to organize, but it's not in the law. I mean, it's not, or should you put in the law that every city should have some debate centers or some things like that? What, what is your experience? No, I don't think you can put that in the law. So, so that it, this was a reaction towards uh, how do you engage people to speak mm -hmm. up to things like this. And I think you have to make the law uh, accessible. So you have to translate uh, the law into a language that other people uh, understand to um, make clear that they start being engaged in this process because the, the fact that indeed uh, and that is what Maxime was was claiming that reconstruction is already starting and that people are already working on things and there is almost no opposition because nobody knows what it, that it's happening so that is a question of making uh, the, the 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 people more aware the public more aware the citizens 
uh, in changing the law itself. I think it's processes like we are having now. It's from the from the community that we are that actually we should make very clear statements and very clear opposition uh, in in clear language also, but also indeed in a positive way with recommendations and not only rejections. Thank you. I have one last question for Maxime uh, before we have to move on uh, already to the second panel. Uh, Maxime, if you look at the law that is now uh, uh, that we're talking about, what would your main recommendation be hearing your full um, uh, list of concerns uh, to change, to really put inside this law or to put outside of the law? I would recommend make an open process of adapting uh, the law of this law. There should be a real open discussion with the community where we could discuss extensively some amendments. And I believe that the main uh, disadvantage is that there is a decision made and the opinion of everybody else is considered either unimportant or is not taken into account. So this opportunity of discussion and step-by-step -step improvement should be a key principle to make this law good and uh, worthy of adopting. Thank you uh, for this clear uh, response on a, not an easy question. Uh, also for you and for Lilette, Thanks a lot for opening this uh, this event, and uh, this is not uh, uh, only the beginning of, of today, and, but it might be a beginning of uh, uh, more meetings afterwards. Thanks a lot. Back to you, Margot, I guess. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank our speakers, Folko. Thank you. And we will continue focusing basically on the legislation. Our speakers will stay with us and they will participate and comment. And uh, they will answer the questions of each other. And we are moving to the discussion of this law and to panel number two. Uh, focusing on the European integration process and we will talk about what waits for us if we adopt this law and whether our legislation is ready for further requirements of the European Union. And I would like to start with the presentation from Anna Bondar. And also this panel will be joined by Anna Kiri and Ruta Leitnata. Thank you a lot. Good evening, everyone. I don't have yeah, everyone, a presentation, um, but I will just uh, express my I don't opinion have a without it. I will it. use my words to present my point of view. So uh, I would like to present to you the backgrounds um, of uh, the bill uh, 5655. So uh, we have been talking about let me tell you how we actually Ukraine, reached this uh, for 20 law. years, but the system of checks and balances was applied to the public um, structures and it resulted in huge uh, corruption and uh, it resulted in uh, the uh, bill 3038 uh, which really changed the balance of interests here and so a lot of um, a lot of project documentation uh, was cancelled uh, civil hearings uh, were cancelled and public hearings uh, were in place only for a fraction of documents. Uh, urban planning uh, councils were cancelled and there were very little activities on the part of the public uh, agencies uh, in this respect. And during the 10 years that this was practiced, this had been practiced, um, our background was formed for um, more authority for developers and uh, controlling agencies. And it is important to say that in 2015, when this process of decentralization started, public control was uh, divided between the places, uh, between the cities and the uh, central state. And so corruption also was spread to municipalities. When uh, 
the elections were finished, uh, when we started to go into European ascension, we started the reform, but unfortunately, what we got as a result, and I am afraid that the key reason for that was uh, the total opacity of the process, the voluntarist attitude towards the process, and uh, ignoring the stakeholders, all this resulted in a bill which shows very brightly that, that Ukraine can uh, finish in the situation of Beirut, because the key players, the key actors are going to be the state and the developers. So, And this is really weird because this cancels our uh, way to our route to decentralization, it cancels the participation of municipalities and civil society that uh, fights for Ukraine. So I believe that uh, decentralization reform is being gra in grave danger here. And яка була передана на підпис президенту. Там є декілька кричущих з моєї точки несправедливостей. Тобто перше це дійсно дуже дивна і нелогічна система контролю і нагляду над всіма суб'єктами. So this law offers quite weird and illogical system of control over all subjects of spatial planning activity. The other one is private control without providing a cert, uh, sufficient number of safeguards. The authors of draft law say this is the experience of France, the US and uh, Great Britain. But of course, I am not well aware of the legislature of this Ukraine. But from what I can see, they have a very powerful institute of the head our architect and this is this process involves a lot of uh, stakeholders and this in allows for powerful private control also this law has raised the question of the profession of architects and their process of certification is will be quite blurred between the institutions who have nothing to do with the rights of the architects and the national association of the architects will be subjected to the ministry of regions uh, the role of the state is strengthened there will be a uh, spatial planning chamber created that will be that will involve a lot of functions such as uh, punishing those who breach the legislation and uh, will involve uh, what I believe is a corruption window that will allow for threatening the subjects of spatial planning. And also the role of the local government will be decreased. A lot of people say that uh, local government is another way of corruption and they often take bribes from developers, but I believe that the function of city control should be performed by, by this local governments, but there should be a lot of safeguards involved. Because Why? Because the people who live in the cities, they choose the city, gov the local government, and they have to ensure safety in the city, in the locality. So those localities have to guarantee to their citizens that the construction will be legal and controlled. And of course, this uh, law does uh, no proposals for the participation of civil society have been provided. So the rights of the city dwellers have been narrowed down. So they will have the right to inform only the mayor about some uh, inspections who can of course walk around with a photo camera take pictures and send this to the control body who then will react i believe that this system is built as a very strong developers lobby and it doesn't take into account 
the opinion of the city dwellers it uh, narrows down the functions of the local self-government bodies and it involves a lot of risks that have already been covered in the examples of beirut and of course this petition that i believe is the most successful petition in the independent ukraine that has gained rapidly the number of votes so the uh, website just closed this uh, opportunity to because there would have been even more signatures it demonstrates the rage of ukrainians and it shows this is not what they expected they expected real participation in decision making regarding their cities and unfortunately the draft law didn't demonstrate that thank you Відповідь так. Олено, я прошу вас перейти на англійський канал. Вибач, окей, сорі. Міс Бондер, thank you very much for your comprehensive um, statement. And I would like also to say that today we have invited our European colleagues because Ukraine is a future member state and we will have to approximate our legislation to the demands of the European Union and so we asked um, we invited Ms. Ruta late night uh, president of uh, the architectural association of Lithuania Lithuania I think still remembers uh, the process of European integration uh, and its way to the European Union. So I think uh, we, we can ask Ms. Leitan Naite uh, uh, to uh, share the uh, challenges uh, Lithuania had to meet uh, in terms of legislation and uh, on our way to the European Union. So you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Margot, and hello, everybody. Uh, very good evening. Um, I will talk not only on behalf of uh, Lithuanian architects, but I'm also here representing Architects Council of Europe. I am the member of the executive board, so I will try to speak uh, with the voice of all the European architects. Nevertheless, I have to admit that I am not uh, a lawyer. I'm not an expert in legal basis of Europe. I am an architect, so I will speak from the perspective of my profession and as a person, as a European citizen. And I also didn't study the project of the law that we are discussing, you know, letter by letter. So I will just give my impression from the comments that I heard and something that I read. And um, of course, at first it strikes me as well, uh, this law, because it breaches the, the very principles of what is the European identity. And regarding the legislative basis related with architecture and urban planning, I have to say that during the recent decades, uh, Europe was preserving very much the principles of transparency in all the legal basis, not only concerning urban planning. So transparency meaning control, meaning money and procedures, and also inclusivity. That means including uh, all the stakeholders at all the levels, starting from government, then going to local government, and then citizens. And since 2018, uh, that was a very happy year of Davos, the word quality was added to the legal basis when talking about urban planning and architecture, quality of architecture, and the principle of culture as a backbone of all the endeavor in, in making our environment. So I think that those uh, three principles they are missing in the in this project of the law and I, I think that you know we are having two ways that are not meeting here so I hope that uh, we are still in, at the beginning of the process when we can make those uh, ways uh, to merge together and then to go to the same European direction as for the details I would say that um, it's a uh, very important when talking about urban planning and architecture, uh, just to remember certain directives and certain fields and actions and tools that can be embedded in, in the national law that help to reach all those three topics of transparency, inclusivity and architecture quality. One of them 
is public procurement law, which is a pain in one place of the body for all the European countries, uh, with the public procurement can be combined with the good principles of good architectural design competition. And the architectural design competition is one of the best tools to achieve the highest architectural and urban quality in the design process. It's a, it's a fair, a transparent procedure. It gives opportunity to everyone. And the principles of selecting is the quality of the idea, not the lowest price. So this is the thing that we are advocating through all the Europe in all the European countries. Uh, then when it comes to public participation, uh, it is very important to secure not only the presentation of the projects that is, you know, it could be executed very formally. It is very important to secure by a law a participation of the citizens of local communities, not only local authorities, in the processes of design making, which is, I'm not sure how it is defined in, in the law that we are discussing today, but uh, from, from what, what I heard, this is not something that, uh, that this law is aiming to. And then uh, while activating the citizens, you get not only you know, that, that peace when everybody knows what is happening, but in this way, you are also activating your own community. And then it's not only private investors that you can rely on. I can understand why such a haste with this law, because the government and the local authorities, they want to rebuild and they feel the urge of housing and the need of you know, social infrastructure. And then the quality ends up in some you know, 22nd place. Uh, but in fact, it has to be one of the priorities because I heard in, in many, many discussions with Ukraines and you are always stressing that you want to rebuild your country, but to rebuild it in a better way than it was before. So if you want to rebuild it in, in a better way than it was before, and it is also some principle that your government is willing to follow, I think that uh, some major changes in this law should, should be made. So thank you, that's enough for me for those five minutes and, and I can join you later for a discussion. Thank you, Ruta. Thank you, Ruta. I would also like to ask you a question. So when you were undergoing this procedure of adapting your previous legislation to the requirements of the European Union, did you have some specific challenges did, do they fit those principles that you talked about just now? Uh, uh, those principles, especially related with quality, uh, related with the Green Deal, about culture, they are quite new. So the whole Europe is trying to adapt to this new way of seeing our environment, a new way of developing uh, Europe. When Lithuania joined European Union, the situation was different in the whole European Union. So, of course, there were some, you know, major challenges, especially when it comes to urban planning, especially related with the private property, because when we, uh, when, when we break out from uh, Soviet Union, uh, before that, uh, there was no private property, and then we had a long process of land restitution, also with a lot of corruption, a lot of not reasonable solutions. And right now, uh, well, it's, it's not you know, as severe as the lesson from Beirut, but we have certain lessons from Lithuania as well. Uh, and, and this lesson, well, the result of this lesson is that almost all the land in the country and in the cities is private. So city has no power, city has no resources to implement the decisions. So we are facing very hard negotiations every time when we have to make a tiny street or when we have to build a kindergarten. Thank you for the, sharing your experience because in fact, right now, this uh, law 
introduces a lot of powers to the state in the regulation process and you demonstrated a different side what can happen if all the land will be in private property we will get back to you with questions and right now i would like to give the floor to anna Kiri. anna are you with us yes thank you uh, i will present some pictures can you all see my screen we will make it a bit better. Can you see it right now? So colleagues, uh, thank you for your discussion and for organizing this discussion and for involving our European colleagues in this discussion. This is crucial. Uh, the topic of this alleged law and these reforms is crucial and paying attention to this is crucial paying attention to this topic is very important and i've been doing this i've been trying to attract attention from july from july of the last year involving a lot of resources in order to talk about it and there was a phrase that the draft law was being discussed, started to be discussed after the parliament voted for it in the second reading. And with this presentation, I would like to show you how we talked about it and how much was said about it. And the architects have become the flagman of this the protest against this uh, urban planning reform. And that's why uh, we are now facing a lot of uh, pressure from the central government. And I will be honest about it. So regarding the presentation and regarding European values, first of all, I would like to talk about this. Because when I personally went to Euromaidan in 2014, when me and my friends and colleagues risked our lives and protected European values. One of those important values for us was the fact that we should participate in decision making in this country. We have to be the owners of our country and we don't want someone to take to make decisions instead of us. And for those who cannot read the slide, the slide says uh, 56, 55 and European values, the reform for architects without architects. I would like to say that this reform was written behind closed doors and we've learned about it approximately a week before voting in the first reading. So do the, the architects were not involved in the concept of the reform, in developing the concept, in writing this reform. So you can substitute the, for, the word architects and say reform for communities without communities. You can say reform for cities without cities. And these words can be substituted with any stakeholders. So those who participated in this reform were developers. The developers were quite active in this reforms and they were the ones who developed it. And they just informed everyone about it. And they presented it as the reform that fight is fighting corruption. So why actually uh, this uh, urban planning reform has to solve the corruption issues? There is something wrong here. So what was the context? Overall, the outside context and the request from the society what was this request? Hanna Bondan mentioned about the deficiencies of this urban planning legislation for the previous 10 years. So when Ukraine became independent, we had a more harmonized legislation with Europe. So the Republic opened platforms when the word of the head architect was quite strong, where there were some approval procedures in the process. So the process of fighting corruption right now is being solved the following way. If the city planning council takes bribes, we will just cancel this council. This is basically the logic that is being applied everywhere, including here. So after 
after the role of the head architect was cancelled, after the competition was basically nivellated, when the councils and their powers were narrowed down. This is the situation we lived in from 2012. So we spent 10 years up until now in this legislation, and we had two major problems in the existing legislation. And right now they reached their critical point. The first problem is the community is not involved in the forming of the space of their cities. So the developers, uh, are just not taking into account this community. And another huge problem is that the whole system is not balanced and it's favoring the interests of the developer who is the most influential player. So there is a request from the society to solve these two major problems. And what we've seen draft law 5655 this draft law does not solve these issues what's more it's deepening these issues i'm I'll add to what uh, anna bondar said the role of the community is decreasing the current law on architecture activity mentioned the opportunity and the right to discuss the project and construction by community. And right now, members of parliament are crossing out this point. And I have read all editions of this draft law. I have a lot of comments. I analyzed this law in detail. And right now, they it is just crossing out this opportunity for public discussion and involvement in sitting planning. And this law 5655 gives more rights to developers and gives less rights to everybody else. So right now we have a state supervision body. If it becomes reality, there will be supervision over all participants of the market besides the developer. The developer would not be part of the supervision at all. Minister of region will be in charge of this uh, supervision, giving way to a lot of corruption and they are going to monitor everyone without, uh, not including the developer. And the developer will only be subject to private control. So this is just deepening the problem. And actually when we saw this 5655, on the 1st of July, 2021, and I will remind everyone this is the day of architecture of Ukraine. So it was not so-called irony or maybe a mean joke. And of course we were shocked and we started protesting this draft law. And here I can demonstrate what happened, the good things that happened since our community unite. So we saw 5655 as a threat after that architects just joined their efforts, they, they united. We decided to become a subject with clear interest. And we realized this interest through projects. Our goal became good and modern architecture. And our big goal was the right of the community for safe and high quality and aesthetic pro, uh, space of Ukrainian cities. So we're trying to include institutionality, property, international connections, and all Ukrainian scope in our work. And we started acting, and we've been acting for one year and a half. We created a platform for communicating, such as Facebook pages, Telegram channels. We formed our requirements to the government. At that point, they concerned uh, architects. We had five requirements stopped in to stop inclusion in copyright. Another one was to prohibit making amendments in the project without the author, which is also part of this draft law. Be if the architect gives its copyright to the developer and the developer presents this as the requirement, this is a quite dangerous story. We ask to take away the norm that allows to project and construct without the architect at all. And this is what we can see happening. We ask to give back the provision 
on architectural activity. This is the law that protects architects right now. And we ask uh, for the right to issue certificate to the professional community, not the government officials. Nothing has been completed from these requirements. Some, there was just some progress in dividing in dividing what can be done by an engineer what can be done by an architect and everything else was ignored so i personally wrote 214 amendments to this law we worked with the mps from all factions we added 400 214 remarks and we wrote a lot of comments with our team. We wrote a lot of posts in social media so that we could unite the community and share our opinions. We held a lot of discussions and meetings. We never rejected and declined any participation in the discussion on draft law, by the way. Here you can see Olena Shulak, Natalia Osmond here. They come to the Office of the Confederation of Developers of Ukraine. They cooperate with them. They can ask us to join online, but they are reluctant to give the floor to us. So this is the story when the government is sitting in the Office of Developers and doing everything with them. They are not hiding this. This is the process. And others can be joined online. And it. For example, in the last subcommittee, we received an invitation, but we were not let in in the Zoom conference. So right now, our opportunity for participation is restricted. We wrote ten, dozens of articles regarding the topic in the media that have a lot of coverage in Ukraine, such as Zerkalo Tizhnya, uh, newspaper and others. So we wrote articles everywhere and we shared the information. We started writing in blogs, we filmed videos. So basically we used all the formats that helped us share information why this draft law is dangerous. We organized an all Ukrainian campaign. Architects turned to streets in 20 cities of Ukraine. We organized at least three press conferences. One of them focused on the open letter to the president of Ukraine and to the head of the parliament and to the head of the cabinet of ministers. And this is just the public part of our work. We share, we sent letters, we wrote analytical texts. So we did a large piece of work to share this information so that our representatives were let in in the committee we organized a campaign that you can see in the picture where we uh, gave the letter to the head of the committee and we made it public so that we can receive the public response from them regarding our participation in the discussion so when the draft law was in developed without us and adopted in the in the first reading, only after that we were let in in the discussion. I attended every subcommittee Anna, meeting. I, sorry to interrupt, but can you uh, wrap up a little bit the discussion? Okay, so I will just share what we've done during these uh, nine meetings. So we organized a campaign uniting thousands of people and I will just show you the slides of our all Ukrainian campaign where people turned to streets and protested. So we tried to attract attention with all the ways we could to focus on the problems that this draft law carries. So giving more powers to developers and non-involvement of the communities. These are two major problems that the draft law carries. So we reached new we learned to act effectively in the conflict environment and this is the result that we had there were 309 votes in favor in the first reading and there were 228 votes in favor in the second reading we had to there should have been 226 votes as a minimum to have this law adopted and we had two more laws unfortunately and here you can see the petition and the number of people who signed the petition 
and this is basically the result that this uh, the passing of this law yielded and we will keep pushing for the veto because there is no other way to improve this draft law so in fact it should just be changed and this is the way to do it i will remind it that this draft law is accessible it can it, it is available on this website of the parliament only from 19th December. And before that, this text was not available. So right now we're trying to maintain a very proactive position. And here you can see my contacts and, and I would be happy and open to any cooperation in order to solve this situation. And for all who is listening to us today, I'm asking you to push for the veto, for vetoing this draft law and for developing and improving it. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, Anna. And I think that Lilet has a question, right? Uh, yeah, this. yeah, and and but also super inspired, of course, by by this. Uh, activism that that has been going on but also by the fact that that indeed it had a result i mean you you clearly pointed out that it, that it helped and and that you changed the opinion by raising all this awareness and that indeed uh, we should go on with it and enforce it and therefore my question would be to to Ruta, um but also maybe to you and to Anna, uh, since this is the panel about Europe, what could, uh, Ruta, you think the, the European organization that, that you are heading uh, help in any way to, to get this also from a more international level? Because I think uh, Anna or... Um, um, one of the Annas could maybe confirm that 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 until now it has been a very local discussion and maybe it could help if it comes from outside also a little bit of pressure. So how could we organize that? Is there a way uh, to do that? So maybe start with Ruta, but maybe also the other two could. Yeah, okay, uh, I will I will try to answer. My answer will be short. I wish I could say uh, that, that we have uh, uh, tools to do that and tools to change the way that governments, national governments think. So usually what Architects Council of Europe does in situations like this and many other situations is trying to approach local governments. But of course, we are professional organizations. So it's not always when we are heard. Of course, when uh, sometimes when we support national organizations with the letters, sometimes even with visits and talks with local governments, sometimes the result could be reached, but this is not always the case. Another uh, way to do that is to approach European Commission and to work with the European institutions. But in this way, uh, I think that this is a, a very long and complex way. Of course, we have to start to do it, but it's not only talking about architecture. I feel that this law is like a, in a sequence of very similar approaches. And probably if we take some other areas of activity, we would see the same values that are embedded in the new laws. So I think that advocating on behalf of European Commission, on behalf of European Parliament towards democratic values in Ukrainian European legislative basis is the way. And uh, here, Architects Council of Europe can help only, you know, pushing for that expression of democratic values, but not pushing European Parliament members to go to Ukraine and to say something. So I would say the first step would be addressing local governments with letters or with visits or with calls, and hopefully they listen. But uh, I can say that architects by the main public, they are not always perceived as, uh, as the fighters for the truth, I would say. And I think that what Anna is doing is 
a really great job, not only because they are changing the mindset of the parliament members in, in, in the Ukrainian government, but it's changing the image of an architect as a profession. What is an architect and what are the values that he or she is, is uh, defending? Because I think that until now, many regular people that are not aware of what architects are doing, they understand us as someone who is doing service for those big businesses. So I, I with all my intervention, I just want to say, uh, Anna and her colleagues at Bravo, you are doing a really, really great job and we will help you in any way that you would feel that could be useful to you. Maybe Anna Bonder, you have something to add? What could Europe do? How could Europe help? I believe that it is very important here to at least read this uh, bill um, and to suggest it to the European experts. I don't know from which organizations, but here we talk about some educational programs when the representatives of Europe would come here and uh, present very simply how this process is organized in Europe, how different parties are involved in this process, what are the principles, what are the stages of regulation in Europe, and then it will be very clear where our reform uh, falls back because we live here and we can feel what the residents, what the com common population wants. And then European experience can help also. And I think that this kind of training program, education would be really important here. And also, I think that if European uh, experts uh, send letters uh, to the Verkhovna Rada, to the uh, president of Ukraine, etc., to all our uh, public bodies um, about risks of post-war reconstruction, it would be really very helpful. Thank you very much uh, for all the comments, for all the statements, because yes, we can see this great challenge uh, in front of us to uh, have low quality reconstruction, and so I think that it is time for us to start the third issue and start the third panel and then continue with a joint discussion because I guess all these issues are interconnected. So our panel three focuses on must-dos of inclusion and participation and we are doing it together with my colleague, Ms. Pomazan. So, Ms. Pomazan continues. Uh, we are opening panel three, and it is all about participation of various stakeholders in um, the development of cities and urban planning. Many speakers today have already addressed this topic, and uh, yet our new speakers uh, are going to discuss more specific roles of stakeholders and uh, the roles that are specified in the uh, bill 5655 and what to do to face the challenges undaunted so um like moderators before me i would like to introduce uh, our speakers and um, each of them will have five minutes to present their positions and points of view so we will start with alexander anissimo who is a researcher of uh, municipal uh, and urban planning, and he uh, rep um, represents Roskid Coalition and uh, coordinates new housing policy projects. So, uh, Mr. Anisimov, can you please tell us uh, what is the situation with the involvement of the communities and the control of um, urban planning um, specified, outlined in this by this bill? Welcome, everyone. Uh, I am really glad to be part of this discussion. Today, I would try to experiment a little bit um, so that we could make our discussion international, which is crucial for us. Uh, 
власне, е, наразі я е, хочу поговорити коротко порівняти певні процеси, які відбуваються сьогодні в Україні з процесами, які відбуваються в Великій Британії, е, відбувалися і відбуваються сьогодні, на жаль, в Великій Британії, які стосуються міського планування та розвитку громад. Ем, ем, в 2010 році Козар... so in... В 2010-2012 Conservative um, Party uh, won the election in, in the UK. For several years before that, they had been doing um, a research um, survey of the major things they need to address when they come to power. And the ideological concept that they uh, introduced when they came to power can be uh, phrased in the following way deregulation, simplifying this planning system and making it more efficient uh, in terms of management for uh, economic growth, uh, the uh, overall term uh, development to promote growth through the new planning system, to promote development and economic uh, efficiency, uh, demystification, and I like this very much, uh, which means to clarify a clear system uh, for all the stakeholders and uh, ensure transparency so that the community and architects, all stakeholders could understand the cause-effect relations in the whole system. Decentralization is the next one, is to give more plan-making powers to communities and neighborhoods and canceling the traditional way of planning and democratization uh, that is using new tools to involve the community uh, in decision making. But the consequences of this system was partial destruction of certain structures and this uh, came with the um, change of the uh, landscape of property in Great Britain where the right to development uh, was a billion uh, dollars present to the developers and I believe that uh, there was no precedent uh, in the history, and actually the solution to many pro problems uh, that emerged from the uh, opacity of the system uh, was all about the lack of funding for local communities and uh, the inefficiency of available tools. So the whole reform uh, was rather more uh, negative and positive, but I would like to turn back to it as soon as I compare it with uh, 5655 bill. I believe that here it looks really very similar, where the idea of global capital and the uh, swift development is used by uh, certain people to get richer in Ukraine. So the narratives I would like to present are the same deregulation, development, the same uh, concept, but uh, together with the new components, including digitalization and uh, planning here is a very uh, dangerous word, centralization again, uh, so this makes uh, new that makes new agencies which would do um, the rules outline the rules for specific uh, projects and again the message of fighting corruption uh, that lessens the amount of control and interface between officials and other actors so the similarities between these two projects uh, is that 
growth is the solution, is presented as a solution. We need to stimulate economic growth, we need to stimulate the uh, possibilities for development, etc. And it means that uh, developers get more power, they get the opportunity to do practically everything on their own property, and uh, also it um, eliminates, they say, red tape. But in Ukraine, unlike Great Britain, we don't have alternative systems at the level of communities. So unlike Great Britain, uh, municipalities lose control over the process and it disempowers communities uh, and powers and deprives them of the ability to act upon development and it weakens the role of professional community. In Britain, this was not exactly the case. In Ukraine, this is the problem. And in my opinion, it is interesting uh, that this bill 5655 practically doesn't address real problems with spatial planning. Rather, it is all about the developers' interests. Uh, uh, dozens of research uh, were, were conducted uh, in Ukraine, and um, one of them I suggested to everyone uh, uh, investigates exactly this. And they are all speaking about outdated uh, documentation, lack of funding. And again, neither of the problems is addressed by the bill, low capacity of the municipality, uh, lack of funding, limited competences of professionals are not addressed in the bill. And these are the real problems. And again, the low quality of the environment uh, in which people are living, low quality of environment is not addressed by the bill. So the question is, whose interests are represented by the bill? If this bill is not based upon the research conducted in Ukraine, and if it doesn't address the current challenges. So my summary is that 5655 bill tries to deliver unfettered growth in the interest of private landowners. And its key message doesn't, doesn't create any quality controls. And we know that uh, construction uh, can be done only in the, in the interest of the develop developers, not in the interest of municipality. So also, it is all about public value capture. capture. And this is, again, what Ukraine uh, phases now, it doesn't address the climate challenges and the challenges of low quality environment and doesn't state any new agenda at all. And also it doesn't consider any democratic participation of the community. And this should have been the priority for such a bill. And so this bill is based upon the untrue expectations imposed expectations of um, some successes uh, that um, took place, had been the case for the UK, uh, USA, we are fed with the information that is simply not true. And my short message, which I would like to keep on screen, I think for donors, it should, should really change the whole game. And here it is. I'm not going to read it, but I think this slide should stay here for further discussion. Thank you so very much. Thank you for your attention. Дуже дякую, Олександре, за таку змістовну презентацію і наглядне порівняння. Я хочу задати Thank you, Alexander, for this substantial presentation and comparison. I have a short question regarding your presentation. You shared a lot of information about the manipulation of certain narratives, saying quite uh, contradictory things. Uh, for example, a lot of lobbyists of this law say that this law gives more rights to communities and prevents uncontrolled development. Could you please share, are there, do you have any thoughts how 
these manipulations could be prevented at the large scale level? Well, I believe that this question is uh, uh, broader that uh, we are focusing on the discussion right now, but Ruta could be uh, Ruta's example could be good for our system in terms of thinking what works in the world and what doesn't, so that our thinking is based at a more systematic assessment of several sectors of architecture, planning, management, design, etc., et, et so that these fields are discussed more detailed and uh, all the we could compare how this uh, works in Lithuania, France, Poland, China, and so on. So this, we should learn from this experience and compare. Right now, we cannot use this knowledge effectively in the political landscape. And I believe that our colleagues from abroad could be helping us uh, sharing those systems and those institutional play, uh, rules that uh, add to the positive impact that could be adopted to Ukrainian context. Thank you, Alexander. And right now we're moving to the next speaker. Our next speaker, Lubomir Zubac, the representative of the Association of the Cities of Ukraine and the deputy mayor on V4 uh, urban planning, Lubomir. We would be very interested in listening how uh, the local Self-government bodies will be impacted by this law and the more broader context of this institution. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. First of all, thank you for this wonderful discussion. And of, in fact, I can represent not only Lviv here, but uh, local governance as on behalf of the Association of Cities. I would like to say thank you for your kind words uh, regarding local government and for the criticism as well. And in fact, both make sense since uh, there is always human factor involved. And if there is a person is uh, moral and professional, we could see the result. And if uh, there is the opposite situation, we could see some negative impact. But in this question, we should approach this question uh, and take a systematic approach. And we should understand the processes happening. Law 5655, in simple words, offers that urban planning is happening without cities so that cities do not impact urban planning and this runs contrary to the very nature of urban planning and this will not work so we can talk about millions of problems at the local level but overall urban planning has always been the responsibility of the local government and this is natural because construction is not an abstract notion it is taking place in a certain community in a certain city and it impacts specific people and yes mistakes are being made there are a lot of mistakes and but in any case if we approach this matter duly, these mistakes can be avoided because at the local level, there is a better cooperation with the community. And from the Pechersky Hills, people who work there cannot see the situation and the problems in the community better than the local government. And I also believe that our urban planning legislation is not perfect. But personally, from my opinion, uh, in my opinion, and as many colleagues say, the key problem is the opposite. It says that the local governance has uh, lacks some functions, and there is a lack of legal opportunities for those who represent the communities, who live in communities, so that they could impact this field. Uh, from the positive side. 
of course, there is the digitalization aspect. This is the trend that we should take into account. However, it's not very clear here in this field as well. I will share one example that we had in the city of Lviv recently. Uh, before the recent elections and uh, before the reform of the uh, administrative and territorial structure, there was a settlement council that was separate but now it joined the city of Lviv. So before the election, there was a phenomen uh, phenomenal case, organized uh, criminal case, a uh, land where uh, there was a building of school there. It was just taken off the balance sheet. This uh, land was given to a civil society organization. And we received this case as a so-called uh, heritage. Of course, we contacted the law enforcement agencies and there was a criminal case started. Uh, this uh, part was arrested. So these procedures were taken to place. But not so long ago, in 2022, a newly created state inspection of architecture and, city and urban planning that has quite a good reputation and is uh, its quality of work is quite different from it, the previous institutions basically gave an approval for construction works taken to take place there and i think they did not have some evil plan and they did not want to uh, promote this corruption scheme but they just did not have this information they did not know about this criminal case they just saw this uh, list of documents in the computer and they just gave approval and these are the things that can keep happening because this draft law uh, private companies that uh, control involve some automatic registration of approval documents. It also involves uh, quite dangerous norms that uh, concern data and, uh, and uh, urban planning restrictions. As of now, this legislation is created to benefit developers and it gives communities a very limited impact uh, on this potential construction because the law does not even provide for some complaints for this situation. So right now, besides the fact that this is not provided for, there is also a prohibition, a ban to demand any conclusions of the city planning council or the historical council regarding the city of Lviv. It is prohibited uh, to work with any graphical material. So they offer to support some abstract construction. And for example, for the city of Lviv, which boasts its historical history, heritage, it's a tragedy because it is very important for us to have high quality construction. We understand that what will take place during our time, time will will remain for centuries, will remain for a long time. So we should pay attention to this because everything is created in the way so that all ideas that certain groups of people have could be implemented and so that the city does not have impact on any of these processes. It will have bad consequences and it will result in the situation when this sensitive field, and this field is quite sensitive in any community, and people are often against certain decisions. And if we don't have the opportunity to impact this situation, people will just turn into streets and will just organize physical opposition to the construction that they do not support. And I believe this is uh, uh, not a beneficial situation. And finally, we started talking about the reconstruction of the country. This is, of course, good and necessary, but we should have a clear understanding that this law is not about reconstruction. This is about construction and building and it concerns not the regions that suffered from um, fighting it concerns other regions 
it concerns square meters and it concerns money but we would like legislators to prioritize the question of the quality of building the aesthetics of building and the spatial planning and comfort for people and for communities so to be honest with you i am sure that this law has to be vetoed and in fact whether it can be improved it is hard to say i believe it is easier to just write a new law because this law does not involve some separate deficiencies this law is one huge problem and one huge mistake that can be uh, turned into a tragedy for ukraine thank you uh, thank you Lubomir. and if i understood you correctly thank you very much Lubomir. and i can see that uh, you uh, judge the um, local authorities as the mediator um, for in the process of spatial planning so do i understand you correctly here absolutely how can you do it otherwise this is the major um, function of local authorities this is the subsidiary principle when the functions must be as close to the people as possible and actually it works when uh, local authorities are wise they always uh, rely upon the community for instance in Lviv we decided that we go to the community when we need to take any kind of decision we go to the plot we talk to the people and believe me everything is very clear and at once so the key role here must be reserved for local authorities and uh, I would like to give the floor to our next speaker, uh, Lydia Shizhevska, uh, an architect and an urban planner. She represents today the National Union of Architects of Ukraine. Also, she has a, an experience of introducing a integrated development uh, in uh, urban planning. So we would really love to hear your experience uh, so you, the floor is yours thank you very much for inviting me and for this panel discussion we can feel that we are not alone in this difficult struggle so from the point of view of this uh, Bill, this is an example how to do it all wrong from the point of view of participation. And so the whole way this bill has made when it was adopted in the first reading uh, on the 1st of June, and then all these meetings were organized to veto it the activists had to start uh, telling uh, the community what was happening. Actually, the authors, the designers of this bill never uh, cared. It's like at school when the teacher asks the question and uh, the person who is trying to raise his hand to answer the question is simply ignored. So I believe that opinions matter. Uh, especially in urban planning. And my experience uh, spans 10 years. And uh, the answer to the question, if we need a reform in this area, yes, we do. And the question about uh, 5655 five, five bill, whether it has anything to do with this reform, the answer will be no. So it's all about the developers, it's all about constraints of local self-government. It's, it's not about the reform, it's not about participation, it's not about that. So not a single word is there about that. How can it be possible to have a bill 
that has 6,000 pages of comparative tables. And yet there are, I think, around 10 people in Ukraine who have read these 6,000 pages. How can this bill be adopted after all this discussion? This is a great mystery and question to me. And participation as such in terms of professional community, in terms of local self-government, who are going then to uh, implement this draft bill, who are going to execute the supervision, are ignorant of this bill. And so it's not possible. It shouldn't be like that. My opinion is that, yes, we do need the reform in urban planning, but this bill has nothing to do with the reform. It lobbies the interests of a specific stakeholder. We have like three stakeholders, the de developer, the architect, and local self-government, which will control the work and the policy, uh, and which will have to uh, implement these policies. So if two of these stakeholders are saying that, no, this bill is not working, I think that something is wrong with it then. So uh, to conclude, I believe that I must support uh, Mr. Zubac here. This bill has nothing to do with the uh, narratives declared by its authors. The question is, do we need the reform? The answer is yes. Do we need digitalization of urban planning, etc.? Yes. But this bill has nothing to do with what we need. And so the only option for us is to veto it and the professional community, the civil society, our international partners must support us in this because it is a great step. The country is going to European Union. We need to amend our laws, change our laws and align them with the uh, European legislation. So we must write a new law and the law that will concern will concern with the reform itself. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Czyżewska. My question would be, uh, Ms. Kiri and Ms. Bonder told us already, um, we can see the, we can hear the opinions from the uh, professional community. Uh, they try to influence the adoption of such bills, but we can see that it is very difficult uh, it is so difficult to be heard for the professional community. So my question would be, do you have any ideas what should take place in the professional uh, community of architects to, to encourage them to be heard so that the community of architects would have more influence in terms of spatial planning? Uh, Ms. Czyżewska answers that the professional community of architects and urban planners is rather small in comparison with the population of Ukraine. And I believe that participation is the answer. Public hearings is the answer. Discussions like we are having now is the answer. Maybe round tables, etc. Now we have the war and it is really a challenge to organize such events. But as soon as the war is ended, we will need to rebuild the country. If we now lose this component, if we cancel uh, participation and discussion, then, then we are not going to, towards the new implementation of new approaches we are not going to Europe, we are not going to European legislation, so we must have participation to ensure our way to Europe, our ascension, and
Тим кутом подивитися на ситуацію, він досить сильно згуртував професійну спільноту. Да? Професійна mm-hmm. спільнота вона виступила ну, як єдиним фронтом. Дуже вам дякую. Тоді ми перейдемо. Ivan Verbitsky is the head of the analytical center SEDOS and is also a researcher of the topic connected to houses, urban development, urban initiatives, and participatory processes. Ivan also has experience of working with various uh, city initiatives and the experience of coordinating participatory processes. Ivan, what can you tell us about participation and involving of various stakeholders, all of the stakeholders that we've discussed today? Uh, thank you for your invitation. Uh, excuse me if you hear music on the background, if uh, it's bothering you, I hope it's not going to be a problem. Actually, speaking about participation and involving varying stakeholders. We can address this topic from various uh, angles. Basically, some stakeholders will be more involved in decision making and some of them will be less involved. And uh, thank you to all the previous speakers who demonstrated even in pictures, examples, uh, how the the draft law was voted for in the parliament. And of course, it gives more impact to the developers and uh, deprives other stakeholders of this impact, such stakeholders as local governments, civil society, act- activists, architectural community, etc. I will also start with questions that I can answer in my speech. One of them was whether, why the law threatens the transparency in management and decision making. Unfortunately, my response will not be very positive because transparent management was not even present. So basically there is not much at uh, risk. So we are in the situation when there is no trust to any stakeholders, be it architectural community. I respect all the representatives of this community here today, but even such respectable institutions as the Union of Architects uh, have a very low level of trust. So when we talk about participation, we also understand that a lot of people, some of whom are present today, know a lot of bad examples of participation and and we're part of them. When we talk about self, local self-government bodies, uh, the association of cities, unfortunately, we also know that in many cities, local self-government bodies, unfortunately, were connected to many unpleasant stories that led to terrible consequences for the cities. We know a lot of uh, stories about the activists who were not quite honest, and uh, uh, the developers can also share a lot of information about them. We can also uh, talk about uh, the ministry that uh, continues to run this reform. So basically in this process of urban planning, there is this lack of trust and the discussion, if we can call it a discussion around this draft law has made everything worse the trust has not increased but i would like to point out that various sides of this discussion have various levels of powers and unfortunately those who developed this draft law were not ready with the dial to the dialogue with those stakeholders who are present here today and it says a lot about the perspective the future perspective to do something and we see that there is the majority of the parliament, there is the profile ministry and the so-called confederation of developers who have more powers than we do and they have access to decision making and there is nothing we can do about it. And as we can see, it does not leave much room for participation. Speaking about participation, it's important to pay attention not to certain involvement procedure, not to some public hearings, because it has been mentioned before. But participation is not so much about it, but about the interest 
in the interest of whom this management is taking place. Unfortunately, the matter of construction in, our, in this country is the question of the opportunity to earn money easily, to gain money, and uh, this is the question that is barely and hardly associated with inclusion. Unfortunately, housing is not accessible in Ukraine. New construction does not solve this problem. Uh, accessible housing is not being created. Uh, there are certain developers who earn money based on this. There are people who would like to invest money in property and there is a community that allows for it not gaining anything from it and so this process does not solve any social problems it targets only one or certain categories of population it is not inclusive and if we talk about some urban planning descriptions, what can we force the legislation to do? We cannot force them to make the accessible housing. We cannot force them to uh, make this spe spatial planning not only inclusive for stakeholders, but uh, convenient for everyone. Unfortunately, this draft law only makes the matter worse. It will mean that we will move in the worst direction. So instead of solving, for example, the problem with housing, which is uh, drastic in Ukraine, because a lot of people have lost their houses or had to leave them, we are solving the problem uh, that the construction business has to earn money, but the people who need housing will not be able to get it. And it will not solve the social problem. We will have a lot of people who do not have housing and we will have new construction happening that would allow the developers to earn money but it will stay empty or it will be commercial property but this will not solve the social problems so basically this story is all about the interests in the interest of whom this management is taking place and uh, this pro this draft law will make the process less inclusive and of course it would be good if this draft law was vetoed or just substituted but by a better one but we should also look deeper at the reasons of problems at the reasons of the lack of trust that has been building for the past 30 years and just vetoing this draft law will not change the matters and i would like that this discussion to um, stimulate, to start a better and more high quality changes for Ukraine. Thank you. So, thank you very much uh, for uh, providing us more context for discussion, showing that the roots of the pro problem lie far beyond this uh, bill it's all about democracy it's all about the structure of the country so my question would be rather global to you you said that it is important to uh, discuss specific participatory practices but rather to think about providing inclusion at a higher level so that the interests of all stakeholders would be taken into account do you have any ideas I believe that the text code of Ukraine could be responsible for this uh, to ensure that the community giving the space for construction, giving approval for construction, could gain some share of the profit uh, in return for sharing a part of its territory. Because people who live nearby in houses, people who use this infrastructure, of course, they are bothered by the fact if there is some uh, unesthetic building take uh, is built here instead of a park of a lake but they are also worried about a lot of other matters in the city they also pay taxes 
for creating, uh, building roads to this uh, building for schools around it, etc. So they have to gain some return from this cost and the budget of the community has to get some profit from this. It could be done for example, by the taxing system, how the property is being taxed. The other thing is some social commitments. Uh, for example, the requirement to maintain a part of a house uh, for socially unprotected categories for make it more to make it more available so that people are not placed in the mobile cities that are very difficult to live in in the winter but those people could be placed in those houses so the social responsibility should be enhanced when we talk about urban planning and this urban planning should target the needs of various social groups uh, thank you ivan i can see that uh, we also have a lot of questions to our speakers Marho, would you like to ask these questions or should I read them? I think we could start from the question to Mr. Zubac, but in fact, I think that other speakers could also react to this question. So what should we do to avoid political corruption when the mayor does not provide conditions for some stakeholders because there are not enough places in neighboring school but other stakeholders gain anything they want because the developer controls local deputies so what should be the counter balance to this thank you to mr julian for the question hello julian haven't seen you for a while so if we uh look at it from the lens of the current events there is an exhaustive list of grounds for issuing or not issuing uh, urban planning uh, conditions or restrictions and social infrastructure is not the grounds for it from my point of view because i personally believe that when it comes to construction we should approach it in a complex way and there cannot be a situation when the city allows to implement a large scale construction that is not supported by, at the same time, supported by the development of the social infrastructure. How to solve this question? First of all, it would be good to return the contribution that I believe it was a uh, drastic mistake to cancel it and I maybe when Mr. Julian was deputy minister it happened during that time but it was we had quite a normal system when everybody focused on their own task the developers constructed paid some contribution to the community and the community developed social infrastructure right now there is no such opportunity we are working on other variants that unfortunately do not have the proper legislative basis for example certain social and economic partnerships some typical agreements we thought of implementing this but currently we are not doing it because we have doubts whether there is sufficient legislative basis for this thank you for this question So, do our architect colleagues uh, have any opinions to voice maybe more comments about legislation? Uh, Ms. Bonder, uh, can you please uh, switch on your mic? We cannot hear you. Yep, we can hear you now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like really to make a comment from the point of view of sound common sense. Here we have two aspects, how to really approach uh, those constraints if the uh, property owner uh, needs to tell us his or her intentions, we need to have a look at his density at the, the city and the public has and the experts have to really uh, have a good look um, 
at, at his project, whether he will ruin the panorama of the city. And this is not in the bill now. So, and the city cannot uh, commission these documents. Uh, another thing is when the, we have constraints, uh, the, these constraints are automated. And then later we have a system of constraints uh, that are applied to the developer so that he wouldn't be able to uh, violate the norms. In different countries, uh, this works differently, but uh, this system must be, must be based on clear parameters, be, uh, which are specified for specific areas. So if the detailed plan of the area has a school and a residential area, then it must also have parameters uh, for density, and it must be set as a constraint so that we won't have uh, overwhelmed schools and kindergartens. So it depends upon how you look at the uh, constraints for development. So unfortunately, 56, 55 doesn't take this into account. On the one hand, we are asking uh, for the uh, intentions. On the other hand, we must really uh, be based upon facts, upon constraints, density, for instance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I can also see that uh, Anna is, has a comment. Yes, I will add a short comment. Uh, actually, yes, there was a practice in Ukraine that before the uh, landlord was awarded, uh, we needed some documents, uh, and uh, these documents had to be uh, supplied with architectural solutions. And uh, I had this experience. I had to go to the municipal council twice a month so to, to review such things. Uh, and so if there were plans for development, then this project together with the architectural solution had to be presented uh, to the municipality. Uh, and in my case, it was like twice a month, the committees that involved expert assessment. And sometimes um, it was repeatedly done and then only then it would be approved. And this used to be the practice, but it is now canceled because for developers, this is inconvenient it uh, makes it uncomfortable for the developers. Uh, but in my opinion, it was a very sound practice because we had regular expert discussions and this was open platform provided by the municipality. And I guess this could be returned. This is one thing that I don't want to be canceled. Thank you. And actually we, are way beyond the time that we planned, but I have a question, which is a brilliant uh, conclusion, I guess, of our discussion. And uh, this is, uh, so the question is whether we have ideas how the international community can help withstand and fight law 5655 and the risks and consequences it carries and are or are there similar draft laws and risks they carry with it because ukraine uh, has certain stereotypes connected to the Eastern Europe and connected to corruption risks present in this Eastern Europe. And it is believed that there should be a long time needed to get rid of those corruption stereotypes. How could we see, how do we see our international partners when it comes to solving these issues in particular Considering that the topic of today is our further Euro integration way, so we would be happy to hear various comments, in particular the comments of Ms. Ruta and Lilat. I'm sorry, dear colleagues, I am with, uh, with no video because I had to change my location. Um, 
I think that the question is uh, way more complex. We are here architects talking about architecture, but the reason of such law lies in fact in the structure of the society. And it takes really a long time. I can say from my experience, you know, from Lithuania, we are 30 years free now, free country, and we are still a young democracy and we are making a lot of mistakes in our own procedures. So I think it takes time and you have to be prepared for that. Uh, I remember there was a question, I think in the third session, uh, what architects could do and how could they re resist those lobbyists from uh, the bigger industry? So I think that here, the, the best partner for the architects is in fact the society. Because I don't think that architects in any European country have such amount of money as the big industries to hire those lobbyists who are going there every day and doing their job. So I would say that these are common people of Ukraine, the communities that you could rely on. That's why I said that the job that Anna is doing is, is really great because this is the way to find your most serious partner in this fight. But also this is very complicated because community is, uh, you know, it's a group of different people, different interests. And right now this community lives in a very extraordinary situation when, you know, not everybody is thinking about the rebuilding. Probably they are thinking about how to heat their home and, and what to give their children uh, for a dinner. So be ready to, uh, to spend more time and more efforts. Probably this would be the solution. I don't see it any other way because uh, politicians are making changes when the society is requiring those changes. And if it's only the architects, I don't think that uh, it's enough. So my suggestion would be, of course, to seek for, uh, for the partners. And um, uh, your, your question was about uh, approaching European standards. So, of course, this law and, and these values that are embedded in these projects, of course, these are not Europeans. I'm not an expert in the procedures of adopting a country as European member. I guess that there will be procedures of checking all your legislative bases. So if you have this law confirmed, so probably in a couple of years or in five years, you will get you know, some you know, negative response from uh, from European Commission that you cannot, if you want to enter uh, European Union, you have to change that law. But you know, we are in haste. I think that the process of rebuilding Ukraine will start as soon as it is possible. So uh, maybe it is too late then, you know, just to wait for the reaction of European Commission. So yeah, we have a, a lot of work to do. So I am just encouraging you to charge on the batteries and to communicate with your own people, which is the main partner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ivana Verbitsko, Ivana. Ruth, and I can see uh, several hands. Про порівняння того, що робилося у Великій Британії, того, що зараз пропонується в Україні, власне, мені здається, що справді міжнародна спільнота може зробити небагато, і Європейський Союз може зробити небагато, місто будівна політика це не те, що регулюється Європейським Союзом, чи як-небудь пов'язано з європейською інтеграцією, добре це чи погано. Але, власне, ідеї, ідеї, які власне лежать в основі цього законопроекту, неоліберальні ідеї того, що потрібно більше будувати, потрібно зробити кращі умови для бізнесу. Це ідеї, які не в Україні виникли, вони були також якимось чином запозичені з в тому числі європейських країн чи інших країн. Та, які проходили цей шлях раніше, але якісь вибіркові речі з цих політиків. And some selective uh, things from these countries have been implemented and some other 
things have not been implementing those related those are related to the control to the public participation uh, related to self social commitments and of that's why we have this mix that uh, has its nature in some selective borrowing from of the ideas from the western countries and i believe that my response regarding what our western colleagues could do is basically keeping track and monitoring of what experience is being shared by Western countries with Ukraine, uh, what mottos are shared, because sometimes these ideas are just some simplified mottos. And I believe Ms. Shulak or some other people focused on them and as a result on these partial ideas and the result we have this draft law we should think about how this exper experience is change is taking place which ideas we are adopting are we adopting them selectively or not are we adopting just something that we like or are we adopting everything uh, thank you ivan i would like Miss Lydia and Miss Anna to comment on this briefly because we have to finalize our event. So, Miss Lydia, I will be very brief. I have a direct response to this question regarding 5655. As a representatives of uh, various European organizations, you could write a letter showing your concern regarding the adoption of this law and uh, involving the support of the architectural community of Ukraine. I believe that we really need these letters and they will express these ideas. And with these letters, we will be able to address our management or you could uh, address, you could address the president, uh, the head of the parliament with your letters, uh, sharing your concern and saying that you see the risks that this draft law involves. Thank you. I will also try to be brief. I will be honest. And I think that European experts and European communities should present themselves as a subject of Ukraine's reconstruction, because everybody is talking that Ukraine depends also on the funding of European, uh, of European funding. And as a community who is planning to carry out this funding, I believe that you definitely have the right to, sh to share your voice in this situation and here definitely you can write letters and uh, we, we will support you in this as Ruta said this not only architects who support this this is also communities the ministry of culture who is against this draft law uh, certain committees of the Verkhovna Rada so in fact there are a lot of actors except for developers who are united against this law. So basically they're just developers and the ministry who will gain a lot of powers. And of course, these two subjects will be in favor of this law. So my proposal to the European community is will be to present themselves as a subject of this process, write uh, the letters and take a proactive stance. We are also planning to write a urban planning code and to make it transparent to show an example how the reforms can be carried out in a transparent way and we would like to see world experts as part of this process but right now unfortunately we have to put out this fire and to veto this law so we are counting on your support I would also like to say a couple of words. I believe that in order to be safe from political risks, which is very difficult when certain topic is being lobbied in the parliament, we should adopt the law on public consultations. It was adopted in the first reading and we have to consider it at the committee and adopt it so that the legislative acts that are submitted by members of parliament are also necessarily discussed by the society even 
some that should involve even some formal discussions at least secondly i believe that european experts and their help and their vision would be extremely important in developing the new urban planning code or another valuable draft law since this if this law is not vetoed it should be complemented with other provisions and it should be corrected some unjust points of this law should be corrected also this war well this war regarding this law that was started by the authors of the draft law it should be finished by the victory of the ukrainian society i believe in the ukrainian society thank you Uh, thank you for this discussion. We are, have uh, been a very interesting discussion, but unfortunately we have to finish and we have to arrive at some conclusions uh, since we all need to rest. We've been discussing for over two hours. I'm very grateful for all to all speakers. And to summarize, I would like to give the floor to our colleague Lilet, who is not uh, a part of this process, let's put it that way who will uh, summarize the two hours and 15 minutes in one minute. <laughs> uh, it, I, I think it was a fantastic discussion and, and the turnout was so great. There have been so many people uh, here on Zoom, but also on the Facebook channels uh, via all the partners. So I think it, it, this is a start. I mean, it, it is so obvious that that we are not ready and there's so much more to tell and so much more to do so this is the start of a conversation it's not the start it's the continuation of a conversation that anna and and others are having already for so long uh but i think maybe this is another attempt of of uniting all those forces together uh and indeed i i very much agree from from what i heard uh, that it shouldn't stay within the architecture community only. Uh, I think uh, Ivan made a good point in, in saying that sometimes the architects are, are not the most trusted ones in society uh, as well. So we have to be also very self-conscious and, and aware of our own position. Uh, and from that sense, broaden the discussion, not only to the architectural field, but really engage and make it more broad to, to uh, the wider society and use all the means we have for that. And I think this group of people, including the audience that, that we don't see in this panel, um, can be of enormous help in, in doing so. So what I would like to, to do is actually make a call uh to everybody to stay in touch uh to you can use the channels of either of the organizations who is here on the table um of course we uh we from rosfit are are totally open to uh, host more of these discussions um but also please give us input ideas uh stay in touch and and come with your great ideas and let's Indeed, as, as Ruta said, th this is something that needs more stamina and a longer term. So um, stay in touch. Thank you all. And I think, Marco, we should just conclude with that. Agree? So I believe that we will finish right now and we will see you very soon because we have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, have a safe and calm evening, everyone, and see you at the next events. Thank you for participation, everyone.